Right, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Life Story Jar webinar with me, Joe Parfit. Most all of you know me, so it's wonderful. I feel like I'm among friends. So if I screw up, you can tell me and I'll cope. <laughs> now I don't even know how to move this blasted thing on. Right, what is going to happen in the next two hours? Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you what a Life Story Jar is. So those of you who don't know what it is, well, it will make some sense. Then we're going to have a little writing lesson. Then we're going to have a writing task. Um, don't be too scared about that. You will have the option to share it, but it is an option. You do not have to. If you share what you've written, you will get live feedback from me and um, everybody else on the call is very welcome to give their feedback in the chat, but not live because we won't have time. The writing task is a 10 minute task, so I shall just warn you, make sure you've got enough paper to write for 10 minutes. So this is a jar. It's a ginger jar. It was designed for me by a great illustrator who's a friend of mine called Kath Brew. Because I, I had this concept because I think we are born perfect, but things happen to us along the way. And sometimes we break. We break into lots of pieces because of some of the bad things that happen to us. But there is a Japanese 15th century art called Kintsugi. And Kintsugi is the art of making, of remaking precious porcelain and sticking it back together again <coughs> with a very special golden glue. I need to mute you all, don't I? I need to mute you all. Ah. Oh dear, how can I mute you all while I'm doing this? Whoops, I need to go back. Ah, I need to go back. See, I'm making a mess already. There. Now I've got to mute you all and I'm not doing very well at this. Can you all mute yourselves, please? Because I can't manage to do it while I'm doing, <laughs> while I'm doing this. Um, so the Kintsugi is that you are put back together with golden glue and the golden glue makes you, makes the item much more precious and more valuable. And I believe that the pieces of the Kintsugi represent our stories. And it is the sharing of those stories that is the golden glue that sticks us back together again. It is said that stories are made of lead, but when we hold them up to the light, they look like gold, which is a wonderful thought. So we are made up of stories. What are those stories? If I am a piece of Kintsugi and I am made up, with, made up of stories, who am I? Is this me? Is this the Joe Parfit that you know who helps people to make books, who used to be known as the book cook and is, lives in my book kitchen helping people to create books made of ingredients? Is that me? Or is this me? Is this the branded me who likes to try and wear purple and have a purple website and purple um, presentations and who helps people to write their books on a one-to-one -one basis? Is that the real me? Or is this me, the person who wrote A Career in Your Suitcase back in 1998 and specialised for many years in helping people to find work that was meaningful? Is that me? Or is this me, the person who loves to teach and have seminars, lots of people round a table, but now on Zoom? Is that me? Or is this me? Is this my story? Is this the person who, when living in Malaysia, was completely petrified at the thought of having my handbag snatched? Turning me into a snivelling wreck who didn't want to go out? I was so scared. Is that me? Or is this me? Is this the, the mother of two boys who went away to university and then boomeranged back again and have now boomeranged away again and boomerang back again frequently? Is that me? 
or is this me, the me who's lived abroad and is always having to talk about the places that I've lived? Am I defined by my expat experience? Is that me? Or is this me, the woman who lives abroad and is constantly torn between help being with my husband in Holland or my mother in the UK and always feeling guilty when I'm in one place because I'm not in the other? Is that me? Or is this me, the hypochondriac? The per See, you probably didn't know I'm a hypochondriac, but that's who I am and you maybe didn't know that. It is another one of my stories. And what about this story? This is a short story I don't share with everybody. I used to be a workaholic. I used to work so hard that I ignored everybody else in my family. And as a result of that, I had a really serious burnout that meant that I couldn't work for six months and had to change my life. Is that me? Is that my story? What is the real Joe Parfit? Somebody's still not muted, by the way. I'm not quite sure who it is, but somebody is still not muted. Um, is that, thank you. Is this the real me? Made of stories glued back together with golden glue because I've just shared them with you. And here I am, made up of these stories. That is the life story jar. The life story jar is a metaphor for the fact that we are made up of our stories. And if you look at the ginger jar here, you'll see that the lid has got a zip on it. Because I believe that so many of us tend to keep our stories inside ourselves and not share them with the world. We keep our mouths shut. And I believe that we shouldn't. I believe that those stories should be shared. Ernest Hemingway said, the world breaks everyone and afterwards many are strong at the broken places, like us. This is me, but it could just as easily be you with your stories there in the pieces of the porcelain jar. Your stories are the pieces that make you who you are. And sharing those stories matters. This is actually a very expensive piece of art that I found in an art gallery near here. It's another sort of kintsugi, this time stuck back together with sellotape. Doug Ota, who wrote a great book called Safe Passage, said that we feel attached to those who know our life stories, showing that it is important that we share them. They're not just for us. They shouldn't just live in our heads. They should be shared. And a friend of mine called Signe, who is a spiritual counsellor, says that even though people tend to repeat, repeatedly tell the same stories over and over in a counselling situation, they don't heal until they really hear themselves. And I believe that in writing them down, you do start to hear yourself. And Brene Brown on Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul Sunday said, owning our story and loving ourselves through the process of owning our story is the bravest thing we will ever do. So I admit that writing your life story and writing down your stories is brave even if the only person who you will ever share them with is yourself. But stories stick. When we tell our stories to other people, they are memorable. Lewis Carroll said, we write not to be understood, but to understand. So it is in the writing that we start to understand ourselves. And when we share our stories with others, because they read them or they listen to them, they start to understand us too. Sharing stories creates connections with others, like glue. Stories are a distillation of what really matters to us. Stories are our legacy. 
a couple of years ago, I published this book, Monday Morning Emails. It's a memoir. It's written as a series of letters between my friend Terry Ann Wilson and myself, with her initially in India and me in the Netherlands, writing about our lives as expat mothers, mothers of boomerang children, and all the, the difficulties that we had faced, the joys, the highs and the lows of living overseas. It was vulnerable, it was honest, it was full of hope. It was extremely difficult to write because it was so honest and we were so open about some really difficult things that have happened to us. But in writing Monday morning emails, we learned that by writing to each other and sharing our stories, we were, our friendship was getting stronger and we were coming to terms. We were, as Lewis Carroll said, starting to understand. It was an incredibly powerful exercise. Sharing is really worth it. So how can we share? You can write it down just for yourself. You can write it down for others to read. You can write it down and then say it aloud in a safe space. And believe me, that has more impact than just writing it down. Keep it sacred, but not secret. I believe it's really worth writing these things down. They stay sacred, but then they're just not secret anymore because you've shared your stories with the page. It's important to be authentic and honest. It's incredibly helpful if your stories will resonate with someone else. Yes, I know it's scary. Not all your stories have to be about being a hypochondriac and being scared of handbag snatching. There are plenty of wonderful, joyous things to write about too, like the birth of your children. But I don't believe it's narcissistic. I don't believe it's pointless. I believe it has tremendous value. It has been proven that by writing down something negative that's happened to you, you lessen the impact of that negative event. By writing down things that are positive experiences, you increase the positive impact of that experience. It is very valuable. So I created a program called the Life Story Jar. And the, the program is made up of lots of lessons focusing on different sorts of, a, of areas in our lives, like people in my past, my family, my travels, growing up, and my, my life story, which is general, and my work. Here is a row of life story jars on a shelf. Metaphorical, of course. Now, yes, I have been told they look a bit like ashes, <laughs> they're urns with ashes in. I hadn't thought of that at the time. They're supposed to be ginger jars, but yes, they do look a bit like ashes, but then they are legacy. So I'm quite happy with that. So how could you start filling your life story jar? Well, I'll prompt you. That's how it works. We're going, I'm going to prompt you today and I'm going to prompt you if you wanted to, to do the course, then I prompt you in all the lessons. So far, I've been working on the life story jar program for a year and so far I've written 44 lessons of the 52 I'm aiming for, aiming for and I'm going to keep going. If you do the Life Story Jar program you get an email every week. That's one way of doing it. You can also join a monthly webinar like this one but without the preamble at the beginning and get feedback and that is also going to be happening once a month from now on. You can work one-on-one -on -one with me. You can take a taster lesson at the lifestoryjar.com that's absolutely free and just try it for yourself. But you're actually going to try it now because if you stick around, you are going to be able to try the Life Story Jar for yourself, see my methods in action and get writing. One thing that I'm doing with the Life Story Jar is that those who want to can compile their pieces into a book. This is mine. So now for the first lesson. We're going to write about a person from your past. But where to start? Well, I'm going to give you some hints on how you could start writing and recording a memory about somebody in your past. There are several ways of doing it. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of, of help here. 
feel free to take a photograph of the screen if you want. So here are two things that I find incredibly helpful when writing life story. The first one is called Spice and it's a tool that I invented um, ooh, 12 years ago as um, a filter through which I can run all the things, all the stories that I write to check that they are going to work and they are going to leap off the page. And Spice is five letters and they stand for specifics, place, character, incident and emotion and I've written them the wrong way around but hey I'm not perfect. Specifics is details, we want some details in your story so people can see what you saw so don't just say the view was amazing, tell us that it was a, a wooded valley of um, oak trees that were and it was autumn and they were all a beautiful russet colour. Name the streets, name the people, give things names, let us see them place everything happens somewhere set the scene show us the room in which it happened show us the street in which it happened show us what show us some some details so that we can really picture it character the best sorts of stories have got a person in them that's what we're going to be focusing on today character the brilliant thing about characters is that characters are people and they speak and when they speak your page has dialogue on it and that really lifts a piece of writing to another level. You're gonna see that in practice later today. Incident, the best stories have something that happens in them, but that doesn't have to be an earthquake or a car accident or giving birth. The incident can be as simple as asking somebody to pass you the sugar. It's just some sort of movement. And then the last one is emotion. That's one people find quite hard, but we want to know how you feel and that really will lift it to another level. So spice, just remember the word spice and it will help you. If you go to my website, you'll be able to find all sorts of free stuff and you'll be able to download some information about this. I have a document called um, The Inside Secrets that goes into great detail about how to use spice. And then the other ones are really old ones, supposedly written by Rudyard Kipling. I, I have six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are why and what and when and who and where and who and how. I've got that wrong. Oh, I've written that down wrong as well. There should be a how in there. Um, there should be a how in there. I'm sorry. Um, so if you answer these questions when you are writing, how did it happen? When did it happen? What happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? And who did it happen with? Then that, and you just try and answer those, then that will also help to give your story some richness and depth. And there are many, many ways of recording your memories, but I'm just gonna give you three ideas today. Three ide ideas, two of them are e easier to achieve than the other. One of them you may never have thought of before. But let's just see what you think about them. So I'm, I'm, so we've got the three, the three different ways you could do it to start with. The first one is to just let it flow and follow your thoughts, which is called stream of consciousness or speed writing or free writing. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. The next way of, of recording a memory is as a list poem. I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. Catherine Cookson calls this prose on short lines, and it's a really great way of recording lots of things in no particular order so that they are recorded. And then the third way is to write it as a story, a story with spice, with a scene, as a snapshot of something that happened. The third one is the hardest, but it's, it doesn't take too long when you remember spice to be able to achieve that. So here's a stream of consciousness example. Now I've made this up completely. I do not have an Aunt Maud, but I'm just showing you what might happen if you were just going to write stream of consciousness. So this is just th one thought after another, no particular order, not worrying if the grammar's right um, and not worrying where you're going, but following your thoughts and allowing your thoughts to just lead you along. So here we go. Here's a stream of consciousness example of the same story I'm going to be um, showing you in the different formats. Aunt Maud was a lazy so-and-so. 
bed-bound, shrunken, grey and wizened, she was perpetually frozen to death and lay there upstairs like Lady Muck, dishing her orders out like bread to overfed pigeons. She had a voice on her, deafening, a million decibels, more like a bellow. Anyone would have believed she had a webcam in her room so she could snoop on what everyone was up to elsewhere in the house. She'd know if someone was smoking. My cousin Jane usually was, and drinking, cans of Stella, every day. Were you born in a barn, she'd yell, or it's brass monkeys up here, or shut the bleeding front door, it's like the North Pole up here. Gosh, she was bossy. She'd, oh, that's a mistake, sorry. She'd lie there under that sickly pink, greasy, moth-eaten patchwork quilt she'd picked up in a jumble sale. She wore bed socks and bed jacket even in summer. She was never warm and never happy. So I haven't tried to write a story. I've just, all my thoughts have just flowed one after the other. And you can do it as a list poem. And this is just line after line, not necessarily with a, a full stop at the end, just the thoughts as they came into my head. So it looks like a poem, but it still gets the information down there. Tiny, wizened, gray, bed bound. Were you born in a barn? Greasy, secondhand patchwork quilt mohair bed jacket. It's like the North Pole, always upstairs yelling orders. I'm freezing my bleeding knickers off up here. Jane slams the front door so the barometer shudders in the hallway. Jane always with a fag in her mouth and a can of Skedzella on the go. Are you smoking indoors Jane? A million decibels that voice. So it actually works pretty well, considering I'm not trying to craft it at all, apart from short line follows short line follows short line. It's a mixture of bits of dialogue and just, just scraps, really. I find that a fantastic tool for recording things quickly. We well, could write it as a story. When I was 15, I used to visit my cousin Jane about once a month. Her mother, my Aunt Maud, was nasty, shriveled, permanently cold and thankfully bed-bound, which meant Jane and I could do whatever we liked downstairs. Almost. It was as if Aunt Maud could see, hear and smell exactly what was going on in the living room. Are you smoking down there? She'd bellow down from her upstairs eerie where she, she, she lay propped up by pink frilly pillows beneath a greasy second-hand patchwork quilt. A right lady muck with a voice too large for such a small woman. No, ma'am, Jane would reply, then blow a string of smoke rings up towards the ceiling. Were you born in a barn who left the door open? Jane, Jane! On and on she'd yell and holler, dishing her orders out. Jane would jam the cigarette in her mouth and stomp off to shut the offending door, open another can of Stella and hand to me, rolling her eyes. It's like the North Pole up here. I'm freezing my knickers off. Jane, Jane. So I've written this more like a story and the difference is that the layout is one of the clues to it being a story because every time somebody new speaks, we start a new line. And um, you will see that there are the inverted commas that start each line. The other thing is that memoir is laid out like this. It's, uh, it's tabbed in for each line, it's tabbed in. Each new paragraph, sorry, is tabbed in. So it looks different, it's more crafted. It's not so dissimilar from the stream of consciousness, but it's been definitely crafted to look like a story. So people make a story work and We've got Aunt Maud in this piece that I've been working on. And a way to, to help you meet them, because when you meet somebody, we can picture them, the reader can picture them, even if they don't know them. You could include their name. Names are really useful because people can always hang on to something when there's a name. You could mention their facial features, their body shape, their body language, the clothes they wear, how they move, quirks, twitches, how they speak, what they say, and how they interact with others. So th those are just some examples of the things that you can add to a character. Character is the C in spice. So all those things can be very useful. Don't necessarily use them all, you can overdo it, but just a few of those can really give the reader some clues. 
Enlivening a story with dialogue is really, really useful because it breaks up, the, it breaks it up. But what I've done here is just, just show you what happens is that when you have a piece of dialogue, after the dialogue, you have what's known as a tag. And a tag is the is the in is the plain the prose that comes after the dialogue. So are you smoking down there is the dialogue. And then the tag is in yellow afterwards. And what the, that does is it gives you some more character of Aunt Maud. And it also she, there's also some movement and action in it. So it can be really powerful for moving a story forward. So the first tag is in yellow and then the second tag is in yellow and you can see that they're the bits that you add on to the dialogue and the great thing about tags is that dialogue people try to remember exactly what people said and it's not always easy to remember the words and they're sometimes quite boring I mean no mum isn't very exciting but the tag that goes with it is and it gives you permission to use some really uninteresting um, dialogue because the tag will then liven it up. So now it's your turn. Here's a prompt. So the prompt I'm going to use for you today is my mother used to say. So you can use my mother used to say, my father used to say, my aunt used to say, it doesn't really matter. Just pick somebody who was older than you. And then I'm going to want you to um, write to either write a story using spice and the six honest serving men or write a stream of consciousness piece just following your thoughts or write a list poem it doesn't matter which way you go um, there's no right there's no wrong all that matters is that you put your pen on the paper and are inspired by my mother used to say and I'm not asking you necessarily to write quickly, just start to write on the topic of what somebody from your past used to say. And so um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to leave this on the screen and I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. And at the end of the 10 minutes, this presentation will not be on the screen. I will be, and we're going to, you're going to get the chance to sh all share your work. So I'm going to set the timer now and I'll see you again in 10 minutes. If anybody has got any questions, I'm not going to be able to see the questions while this is on the screen, I'm afraid. So um, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Okay. So, well, thank you all very, very much for listening. Thank you very much for seeing what happens with the Life Story Jar. I'm going to share my other screen so that I've got some things on it and I've forgotten what I've got on it, but I'm going to share it anyway. To show you um, the end of the presentation, because I think I just want to say that Leonard Cohen wrote, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I think that's a very important thing to remember about the value of writing stories. And then that's just in, and just to let you know that you can take a free taster lesson of the Life Story Jar and join the next Life Story Jar live if you want to through the, um, the links on this screen. <laughs>